Hey guys, this week I wanted to wrap up another long-term project we've had at ITS, and that's building a MAME cabinet so we can play old-school Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis games here at the shop. So this is obviously not necessarily tactical related, uh, other than our wrap that looks like our logo, but I wanted to walk through how I built this and give a little nod to the arcade community because I figured out something I think is going to help other people trying to do this at home. All right, for those of you that already know what a MAME cabinet is or MAME in general is, this will be a little redundant, but MAME stands for Multi Arcade Machine Emulation. So this machine is emulating the old school Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, Atari, all those things. It's got everything on here. So I was able to find all those online because of course I own all those games. So therefore, that's why I'm legally able to have the ROMs on that machine. So. This happens to be Balloon Flight, one of my favorite old Nintendo games. You can see it playing here. This was a little bit hard to put together only from the aspect that I wanted to use the original monitor. So this used to be a Golden T99 machine, and I think it was kind of a bastardization of a Golden T99. It wasn't a true Golden T because I think that was like a retrofit kit that bars and arcades could buy to put into this style of cabinet because this is the old Konami cabinet that you might recognize from like the Simpsons arcade machine, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade machine. This is that same big four player cabinet. It's a little bulky, so it's not what I would recommend if you're gonna build one at home that you don't need four players for. I really don't need four players. There's not a lot of games that are technically four players, um, even on all the ROMs that I have on here. However, it's just kind of an exercise that I wanted to take myself through to see if I could do it, which, was why I used this monitor too. So this is the original CRT monitor that came in there and that was my huge challenge with this. I think that was the hardest thing that I did on this um, because I couldn't find any documentation on anyone that had ever done this before other than one group of students in an old random online article that was you know, kind of created years ago. So I'm gonna walk through that and show you kind of how I got started with this um, through the photos, which you'll see, um, but also kind of what those cards look like that's enabling this to run this monitor right now because it's actually kind of difficult. It's not something that's, that's standard that you can do with an arcade cabinet, which I know a lot of people will run these when they do traditional game systems like a 60-in-1 cabinet. That's a little bit easier, but this being a MAME, it's a little bit harder to transition like the Raspberry Pi card where the software lives into an actual CRT arcade monitor like this or CGA, whatever you want to call it. This style of monitor is a little bit difficult to use. So I want to start off obviously talking about how this used to be a golden tee, but then I wanted to get into how this thing runs. So it runs on a Raspberry Pi and I'll open up the back. I actually designed this whole little shelf that slides out so it's easy to work on. Uh, but when I started doing this, it's actually really easy to use an HDMI monitor with this system. So it's much more intuitive than I'm going to show you. This is probably the most difficult way that you could make a MAME cabinet, but however, I wanted to learn as I went, and that's why I kind of undertook this operation, if you will. So when I stripped out all the bits and pieces from the Golden T99, I was left with the outer shell. Um, I started doing some things to the shell itself, like cleaning it up. It was nasty when I first bought it. Um, I wound up sanding some stuff down, refinished some parts. I actually powder coated a few parts too, just black like the metal stanchions that hold the, um, I guess you call it like the display screen or the translate, that's what it's called. So the translate up here, so these things I recoded, this deal on the control panel I recoded. I had to make a whole new control panel, which was one of my challenges. I've never really, used a router per se too much, so I had to learn how to use a, a side router bit to actually cut this channel for the, the molding, I guess that's what you call it. So like the arcade molding that's on here, I had to, re, when I rebuilt the control panel, I had to recreate that because basically when I took out all the golden T controls and buttons and switches and things like that, the control panel up here was pretty much dead. It was, it was just kind of a hunk of junk at that point. The holes were cut in the wrong places. And I know there's a way you can repair that, but I really wanted to start from scratch and fresh. So I used a piece of MDF. I cut that to the same shape using a template I traced from the existing panel. It's not a one for one copy of it, but it's pretty damn close. I, I think I did a okay job with it. And I knew it was gonna get wrapped anyway with a vinyl wrap. So I wasn't 
super concerned about how beautiful it looked necessarily. So everything was kept the same really with the cabinet, used the same cabinet itself. Um, even this surround that's around the monitor was, was kept the same. I did go through and paint everything black first, just so I had a, a nice surface for the vinyl wrap to adhere to because I was worried if I didn't paint it that it wasn't going to adhere to kind of the particle board that this cabin is made out of. So that was a huge thing that, that took a little while too. I had to make sure to sand everything, get all the old graphics off. That was a pain in the butt. Um, and I did cut a new monitor bezel out of some cardstock. It's like basically black cardstock. So I had to kind of figure out how I was gonna do that with a template. Um, that, was, that was kind of a, a little bit to do. And the trans light that's up here, I actually had printed somewhere online. So I found a place that could print these trans lights. I laid this out um, with the graphics that Matt created for us, this whole low poly art that we use for our logo. Matt created and we wrapped everything with this. So he had to create the file. This is actually all a Illustrator file, which is crazy. So we wanted to make sure it was nice and sharp and look good. So that's what we use. And then my buddy Wes came over and applied all the the vinyl wrap to this too, so it was, uh, it was a little bit complicated. Um, and then everything that's powered is running off the power supply, an arcade power supply in the back. So I guess at this point, let me walk through the controls a little more and then I'll wheel this thing around and we'll look in the back of this and I'll point out the different cards and wiring and all the craziness that I did here. So uh, this is, like I said, a four person cabinet. Um, I wanted a layout of six buttons because I took a look at that and I said, well, there are no games on these old systems that use eight buttons, so sometimes you can use eight. I knew there are games that use six, so I wanted to have more than that so I could custom program that through the Raspberry Pi. Um, and the actual emulator I'm using for this is, boy, something pie. Um, Retro pie, thank you. Yes, so RetroPi is the software that this is running on, and it runs on a Raspberry Pi, which we'll take a look at too. And then I'll kind of explain how all this gets routed up into the actual buttons that control these things. So um, it's really easy if you want to use something like a old Super Nintendo controller like this. They make USB versions of these now. Um, this is 8-bit dough. I don't know if that's how you say it, but anyway, this is a USB controlled um, control that I have into the Raspberry Pi just in case. This is kind of my fail safe as I'm continuing to wire up these buttons because I'm not quite through with the wiring of all four players yet and I'm still kind of looking at that. So that's, uh, that's where that stands. But I wanted to make sure there's a rollerball because um, I knew I wanted to have some arcade games on here too, which those don't really sometimes translate well into MAME cabinets. So I actually built a separate 60-in-1 card, and that's kind of going down a rabbit hole. But anyway, um, there are some games, though, that use the, the roller or the trackball, so I wanted to make sure I had one of those in here. And then I kind of designed everything around it with the control panel, so made sure there was a couple of cup holders, and obviously there's four-player controls, and on four-player games, you don't need any more than four buttons, which is why I did that. So this is kind of a nod to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's got these four colors for Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Raphael. So that's where the color scheme came from. And it's kind of colors that are in this already. So let's wheel this around and look at the back. All right, so these old cabinets are really bulky, and I was actually happy that this was installed, not by me, whoever had this cabinet originally. I bought this thing for like 300 bucks with the golden tea still inside, and it was kind of a piece of garbage. But Anyway, one of the functions I really like is that you can twist this little thing. Someone rigged this up, and it kind of helps hold the, the back door on here so that all you have to do is push this, turn that, and it's pretty easy. So I really like that feature. These were some of the parts that I got powder coated as well. They were just kind of rusty bolts at the time. So as you can see, this is kind of the original Data East, that's the name I was trying to think of earlier. That's the cabinet that this used to be. Um, so it's an old Data East cabinet. Um, on the inside, you'll see the huge CRT monitor. I'll, I'll open this drawer up, but I wanted to kind of show this first. So I had to come up with a way to, to get the power wire on the inside. I purchased this um, power supply or power 
I don't know what you call it, power pass through? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know what that's actually called. I'll make sure it's in the description though, because I plan on putting all the stuff that we used in the description. So if you want to take this project on yourself, you can do that as well. But I also added these wheels. You, I don't know if you can really see those, but however, I put these wheels on the, the back too, these casters, just because this cabinet is so unwieldy and heavy that it really needs that for you to be able to lift the front and, and wheel it around and, and work with it. So that was important for me to have, and that's why I kind of took that on. And then this drawer system I built myself just on little drawer sliders. Um, this is just more pieces of MDF, but I wanted to be able to make sure I could work on this easily, and then I'm kind of obsessive compulsive when it comes to wiring, and that's what I kind of laid out with this too, so that I could not only work on that, but that it could be easy to, to work on as well. So let's go on and get into exactly what is going on here in this drawer system. Okay, so before I pulled the drawer out, I wanted to just mention this is the 110 circuit. So you can't see behind this thing, but really all this is doing is taking this, wiring up this little switch here, and then the output lines from that 110 are coming in to these three lines here. So white, green, and black. The power comes in through the drawer. I've got enough slack here so that when I pull this, I can actually slide the drawer all the way out and work on it if I need to. So. I'm obsessive compulsive when it came to wiring. I wanted to make sure this looked really cool. So I took a lot of time actually laying this out. Um, had wires all over the place. They were taped down. I, I kind of did a test run with this thing before I actually put it into this, this uh, drawer that I built. So it starts out with that 110 that comes in, as I mentioned, it comes into this little filter here. And through the filter, it gets grounded and those grounds run to various places. So the main ground is running to this power supply. So this is an arcade power supply. It's got plus five volts, uh, minus five volts, 12 volts, or plus 12 volts, and it's got um, also the grounds to it too. So basically it's a way to take the 110 and turn it into different power. So um, it accepts the 110 and then and transfers it basically to to different power. Um, you can actually raise the power up and down, but really what I'm using this for is to output the different voltages that these various things in the cabinet need. So for instance, the orange wires you can't really see here are running up to the 12 volts needed for the LED light that lights up the trans light at the very top of this cabinet. So that's 12 volts. It's just an example. Um, and then so something like the minus five volts is actually coming off and running the, um, the amp that is powering the speakers. I think I've got that right. Actually, I think it's vice versa. So the blue and green, sorry, blue and green is actually running the trans light while the orange 12 volts is running the amplifier and the speakers for the cabinet. So you didn't hear sound yet, but there is sound on the game cabinet. So again, the power actually comes out after it's been grounded. Then it gets transferred over to this side, and this is a transformer that the monitor needs um, to, to translate into the, the 100 volts that it needs to power the monitor. Uh, but the real catch to this, and this is really what I wanted to explain, is that this was something that I had to kind of figure out on my own here with this card. So basically, this is a, a VGA to CGA card. Um, it really wasn't intuitive when I learned how to do all this. I just kind of had to kind of figure things out. So basically, this, these are the, the lines that come off of the monitor. So these are the, the power as well as the, um, the actual color lines that come off of this to be able to manipulate the monitor signal. So I've got basically just got a Molex connector here, but then I output to this connector here on the card, and then this is where the magic kind of happens with the conversion. Because as I mentioned earlier, it'd be really easy to just put a HDMI monitor in here and, and run an HDMI monitor, but then it's the aspect ratio is gonna be weird. The refresh rate really gets weird on old arcade games too, um, because it's not the same as like the old CRT that you might have been used to playing Nintendo on. So Basically, it comes into this card. This is the power line that comes into the card. Then it outputs this video signal from the existing CRT monitor 
transfers it to VGA and then the VGA transfers to HDMI and the HDMI goes into the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is where the games live on, if I can pull that, on this little SD card here, little micro SD. And then it's got four USB ports and the USB ports are kind of how the, the game gets controlled. So as I mentioned earlier, that, that Super Nintendo controller I held up is one of the USB ports and this is just kind of my backup just in case the controls go bad, I can still control the game and figure out what's going on. Uh, but then one of the USB lines runs off to this JAMA controller and the JAMA controller is how I would wire the whole game up if I wanted to, but I've actually gone ahead and done something even dumber and a lot harder, which is I've actually taken the USB to an iPad card and when we look inside the control panel again, when I give you guys a better view, you can kind of see what I'm doing here. I just briefly wanted to explain that really the only thing I'm using this JAMA card for, and this is from Ultimark, this is the company that makes the iPad card too, is really just to output the power to the coin door to light up the lights. It doesn't even take coins or <laughs> use coins, but I wanted to be able to do that and that was, that was kind of the authentic arcade way of doing it, which is why I did it that way. And it's kind of a dumb way to do it, but it is what it is. And then this is also um, outputting the trackball too. So the trackball is one of these USB controls and the other is going to all the other controls. And then this is the audio line coming from the amplifier uh, that's going into the audio in from the uh, Raspberry Pi. So really this is just an elaborate way to get power to the game and to <laughs> allow me to use the old crappy CRT monitor, which as soon as this does blow, I will be putting in just an HDMI monitor. Um, it will probably look a lot crisper. It may not be exactly right with the refresh rates and everything like that, but you know, it is what it is. Okay, so here's the inside of the control panel, and I'll kind of explain a little bit of my juxtaposition here on why I have not finished this. So this was my initial wiring. I wanted to make sure that at least the first player controller worked properly. I wanted to use these super elaborate switch blocks. So everything at the end of these wires has these little terminals, which I think are just kind of a cool way to wire up games. So I wanted to be able to do that and use those terminals at the end of each one of these wires. And then they kind of go through this terminal block and then the terminal block then goes into the iPad card. So again, the most complicated way I could have thought of to do this is the way I did it. And uh, it's really kind of bit me in the butt just a little bit. But anyway, what I wanted to really be able to do is jump the ground. So basically every one of these switches. So if you go to a button or let me actually pull these out, I'll show you. So each button or joystick is controlled with one of these switches. So this is the actual activation on the switch. And then it's got a ground and a power coming from each one of the switches. So each one of those requires two wires coming off of it, a black that jumps between everything for the ground, and then a power wire that runs to the switch block here. So this was the way of jumping the ground between all the controls. And then this way I actually wired in separate ground and power running through a two pair speaker wire like this. So it's got the, you know, the power and the ground comes through there. So every one of the buttons gets grounded. So this is like my proof of concept, the messy crappy way and the nice organized, ridiculous overdone way of doing it, which I'm leaning more towards. However, I want to do something that actually uses the color of wire that goes through each one of the controls, which will make it easier if I have a problem to go back and diagnose the the wire because I can isolate the color wires. So it's not going to look all crazy and rat's nesty like this stuff. It's eventually going to look nice and clean like this. I'll have the braided cable um, between everything and you know a piece of uh, a heat shrink tubing too to kind of close off all the ends. This is falling a little bit. Anyway, so this was one of the USB lines that I had going from the Raspberry Pi and I wanted to kind of show what this is doing. So. This is actually both of the USB lines. One's through a braided cable going up here to control the trackball, and then the other is going into this iPad card, which mimics all the controls. So it literally has a left, right, up, down, A, B, A, B, select, start, you know, the old Konami code, um, on how you wire all this stuff in. So each button has an independent location. 
I just wanted to do it through this block because it would, it would enable me to jump the ground between all these and looks just a little cleaner. Um, however, it's obviously becoming quite a monster and that's why I probably haven't finished it and I've been procrastinating on the wiring. But either way, I wanted to show you what was going on in here and kind of where we stand. I can at least play a two-player game right now with the way everything stands. Actually, I still have to jump these to this board. However, pay no attention to that. Um, I did figure out this way to use this O-ring um, to hold in the cup holders. So that's, uh, let me get that. that's how you put in the cup holders. I thought it would be cool to just use an oversized O-ring and just pressure fit it in there. So that's kind of how I figured out how to build a main arcade cabinet. It took me a lot of time to research it. Um, obviously, I tried to do it the hardest way imaginable. You don't have to do anything this crazy when you, when you go to build yours. If you want to build one, you can get away with doing something a lot cheaper. You don't even have to have a cabinet enclosure for it. You can literally just get a Raspberry Pi, um, a couple of buttons on a piece of wood and a platform, or you can even use an old gamepad like this and play it all USB. Like You don't have to get this crazy, but there are definitely varying applications for this, and this way is mine.